Hey Glass Harp fans, uh, this is Neil here with John Safera, and I'm picking his brain for, for all of us, asking some questions about uh, a whole lot of things maybe, but uh, this is about uh, the recording of the first album at Electric Ladyland Studios and what John remembers about the experience. John Safera. <laughs> well, we were talking about, um, you were saying that Al and Nick the road crew went in, and I think John Markovich was there, of course. And they went in to get the equipment, and they heard on the radio that Jimi Hendrix had passed away the night before. And um, we didn't, me and Dan and Phil didn't hear about that until we got to the studio that day. We went over to say goodbye to everyone. I think that's why we went there. And then we, we left that you know, later on that day, but when we walked in, that's when we found out that Hendrix had passed away. Um, some of the people in there were pretty upset about it. I know the receptionist was kind of crying, but it was it was kind of different, you know, it was, it was very strange. But um, what else do you want to know? I was wondering, um, well, we, we, of course, we've gone over a million times about the rumor that Jimmy said that Phil was the best guitar player. But um, our friend Randy Turner had done so much research, and he could never determine that Jimmy would have ever heard Phil because uh, he didn't find any uh, reports that uh, Jimmy had played with you guys or near you guys where he could have heard you. But do you have anything to offer on that? No, not that I know of. I know... It took us a week to record that first album, so we went in like that uh, from Monday, and we were done by Thursday, and that's when he died. So he wouldn't, I don't think he would have heard us in the Phil in the studio. Um, but also too, I I don't think, I mean that that rumor's been debunked. There is no uh, Johnny Carson show, or I don't know the other late night talk shows of the of the era. There is no recording of Jimi Hendrix saying that. Um, I think our manager, Chip Killinger, started that rumor. <laughs> Do you really? Well, the first place I heard it was we were coming down the elevator in, in a hotel in New York City um, on our way to the studio. And um, I think some vaguely, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, if anybody ever comes up to you and says that Hendrix heard Phil and thinks he's the best, don't deny it. So That's, I, think, I think Chip started that rumor. Bless his heart, then. I mean, it sure, it took wings over all these years. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's on Snopes. Yeah. As a, as a rumor. But um, I, that's what I think. I think our manager just decided to do that. That's a really clever move. So, well, you know, Chip I was really clever. He was a gr really nice man. Um, John, I, I, I don't think John expected any of this today. And I, it just kind of happened here. We're going to have lunch and visit for a bit. But John, um, what was it like going into the studio for the first time? I mean, I, I you know, I don't think I, of all the years I've known you, I've really asked you, uh, you know, how'd you feel? What was, you know, how did, how did it go? Well, it's been so long ago, I, I really don't remember that much. And I can imagine that I was nervous, hoping that everything would go well. And at the same time, I was uh, really enjoying the experience of being in, you know, with the technology of the day around me. And um, just kind of having fun with that. And, uh, you know, I, in those days, it was like a thrill to record in any circumstance, even at home, you know, with a cassette player or a reel to reel. To be in a major recording studio, state of the art, that was you know awesome. With the, a man like Louis Mernstein, well, I had no idea who Louis Mernstein was. Oh, so you didn't have that nervousness then on top of you? I was just some old guy that knew the music. <laughs> I mean, knew how to record people and was a producer. But um, yeah, the... I didn't know what Mernstein was. That he had a track record with. Um, uh, he had recorded Van Morrison's mm -hmm. album Astral Reads and won some awards for that. Before that, he was doing children's uh, uh, um, records and jazz. And I think he did the association, too. He did a whole too. bunch of stuff, yeah. But I, I was totally unaware of that. Um, 
I was into the engineers. Mm -hmm. I thought they were, to me, they were more illustrious than anybody mm -hmm. else. You know, I thought, wow, these guys are hip. But, um, yeah, I, it was, um, it's hard to remember, you know, my exact feelings and all that, but that was it in a nutshell. You know, I was, I was apprehensive that uh, everything would go well and there'd be no train wrecks. You know, we wouldn't have trouble for whatever reason. And, of course, as a musician, you always worry about or have concern about your equipment, you know, that everything was going to go right. I remember in those days when I was younger, feeling comfortable and right at my drum set, that everything was set up just right and all the everything was working the way I liked it. That was really important. Nowadays, I don't care about that. I'll, I'll just sit at any drum set or whatever. But in those days, I had to feel exactly comfortable, which I did, you know, at, at those sessions. You, well, I, from my, uh, what I remember about you in, in those days is you just kind of, you were just over top of the whole kit and you were just like uh, animal from the Sesame Street, man. You were just a basher. And, uh, and uh, I think that's changed. You, uh, you don't seem to play like that anymore, but, uh, um, well, I, well, I'm still at it. If you don't mind, if you, I mean, if this is a problem, I will shut it off, but I think I'm enjoying it. And I think our fans will, would love hearing it from you. If you don't mind going a little further. No. Great. Well, okay. So when you went in to, to do the first album, most of those songs you, you had, there was a rumor that, uh, look in the sky was written at the studio. But I know from jam tapes and things, I know you were doing some of that music before. But... No, Look in the Sky was a, a song we had been performing for quite a while Okay. before we recorded. Okay. So, uh, second album. Uh, was that the one you got in trouble with Lewis? Or was it the third album you got in trouble with Lewis, Mernstein? Um, what do you mean? Well, we discussed this before. For people that don't know at home, um, Glass Harp never practiced, right? You guys, everything you did pretty much was born out of live. I mean, you did do some, but but not to, to the degree that a lot of bands will rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. Is that correct? Because well, I remember you telling me one time. I practiced quite a bit, actually. Oh, okay. Um, we were playing three, four nights a week. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't a lot of time, but we would go to um, certain clubs and rehearse in the afternoons. Oh, okay. Um, we always had new cover material. Mm -hmm. Like every week, every month, there had to be new cover material. Um, mainly, we le we learned every Beatles record that ever was released and, and stuff like that. But no, we actually did rehearse quite a bit. I think what mm -hmm. you're referring to is that we had a lot of song ideas, but we didn't have beginnings or endings to these songs or we might not have had a chorus to certain ideas that we did. Because the first album, we had three, two, two years of playing right. every night and doing right. these songs and they developed like that. But the second album, we had these bits and pieces. Some songs were, were complete. Other songs, like I said, didn't have uh, maybe choruses, well, they had choruses, but didn't have a middle part, a bridge, or needed an ending. And um, I think uh, we were taking a, a long time to work these things through. And uh, I think Mernstein came in the first couple of days we were there, the producer, Louis Mernstein. And then he left, and I think he went out on a, on a boat sailing or something. So he was gone for a few weeks. And uh, when he got back, we were still working on, on stuff. And... Um, you know, that cuts into the production company's money. Sure. So the first album we recorded in four days, and that one we were in there for three weeks by the time. So, you know, he was like, hey, you guys, you know, and plus, what's this hotel bill? You guys are having room service every night. And, uh, you know, $11 hamburgers <laughs> in those days, were, were that was pretty expensive. But, um, so yeah, that was, but I think we, we got that together right away. Um, there were several songs that I remember finishing in, in the hotel room. We worked on quite a bit, but um, yeah, I remember. 
the first time you told me the story, we were having a lunch together, and I remember we both cracked up so much that, I mean, I had tears in my eyes laughing about it because you said that uh, it was like schoolboys that uh, Mernstein called you into the, the booth or something and said, listen, guys, you know, what's this uh, champagne to uh, Humble Pie, Peter Frampton or something? Was it Nicky? Or was, you mentioned somebody on the crew uh, found found the art of uh, room service and... And uh, and remember the day you told me you were saying like Bernstein's jumping all over you guys. Can't think, you walk downtown and get a hamburger? I think or something? That Al was was uh, the one that was the connoisseur of the group <laughs> and you know, was ordering different bottles of wine and some champagne, but not, you know not too much champagne. I remember we were, Humble Pie was staying at the same hotel and they were playing um, with Grand Funk Railroad at Shea Stadium. And we were there at the same hotel, and they they were going came home and were going to an after party, and uh, Steve Marriott had a, a giant bottle of uh, of champagne with him in the in the elevator, and it was like about up to his waist, and it was huge, <laughs> and we thought that was funny, so that might be what you think. Yeah, about, but yeah, he, you know, we we didn't know any better, you know. So you were more prepared then when the third album, when it came time to do the third album? I don't know if we were more prepared. We were about, probably in about the same boat. We had a lot of song ideas, and some were finished, you know, when we were there, and other songs had been developed over a period of time playing live. Um, a lot of songs, a lot of songs we, we wrote and... Uh, and recorded, but they weren't really something that we wanted to play live. Mm -hmm. A lot of songs, you know, like they weren't, you know, like like sailing on a river. We never we played live, but we never really played that much. We never played that before it was recorded. Mm -hmm. I had wrote that one with my acoustic guitar, and played drums on that, and sang in the studio, and uh, we, we we performed it a few times live after that um but um that was one that was kind of wasn't recorded to play live mm -hmm. a lot of songs w were with that in mind you know in the in those days the beatles weren't playing live they were doing the first rock videos setting videos around instead of live performances but it was like a studio thing you know so that's the way we were thinking like some songs are are, mm -hmm. are good for playing out live in concert and other songs were just written to be recorded you know so that was that you know there's lots of songs on on the on the albums the third album had quite a few of them like the seeing you mm -hmm. uh, la di da um just a lot of them were recorded just for the the joy of recording the material it wasn't like, oh, we're going to play this live or we have to play this live. Right. You know. Um, uh, I also want to ask you about Carnegie Hall. Uh, what was it like for a young kid to be walking on a stage? I mean, were you, were you flipping out or were you calm about it? Or uh, I've got a friend in New York who was there for the show and he didn't know you. He went to see the Kinks. And after I became friends with him, he said, oh, you know, we talk. Of course, I always bring up Glass Harp because you're my favorite band. And uh, and he said, oh, I remember them. I saw them open for the Kinks. They were phenomenal. But um, it was a good night. We played, we played well that night. Um, yeah, I was 18 years old or 19. And uh, but it was scary, a little scary. I didn't flip out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I felt like, well, you know, I hope, hope we do well, and you know, don't nothing goes wrong with the equipment, <laughs> and uh, you know, that sort of thing. And um, I remember uh, just before we played, I, I was, I was, of course, we were backstage, and I, from talking to Phil, I mean, and hearing him being interviewed, I know that he went upstairs and was praying. I don't know what Daniel was doing, but I, I was alone. Uh, behind the stage, behind the second curtain, when my drums were set up, and there was a curtain behind the drums, and you know that that closed was closed, it stayed closed, 
but my drum set was right there on my stool and I was sitting behind there on a, on a folding chair and just thinking, well, you know, I hope, you know, I hope this does good and I'm kind of peeking out <laughs> a little bit. And uh, it was, um, like I said in the interview for the Carnegie Hall um, album sleeve, which has a big whole write-up about everybody's thoughts and feelings that they can remember of the day. But, um, you know, I, I felt, um, I lost my train of thought. You were sitting back there thinking about, uh, yeah. And as soon as, you know, they announced us and we went out and to a little applause and, um, we started with look in the sky, which was, we usually started with look in the sky in those days. And, um, after, you know, the first few, few bars of the intro, um, and we got in, came into the verse, I, I felt totally comfortable. And I, I noticed right away that the audience was perked up and was listening. Mm -hmm. So of course, Look in the Sky has a pretty interesting intro. The whole deal, mm -hmm. the suspended G chord and the thundering drums and bass and all that. So. And then that big kick, people everywhere when into that part and just the yeah, I think, yeah I think that it was kind of cool there, you know we, we did a lot of shows you know Fillmore East the Orpheum Theater in Baltimore and Boston and uh, opened for a lot of headliners in those days and you know it was a little nerve-wracking but uh, I think mean, because of Phil's prowess that you know we always um, impressed the audience in a good way so I also got to ask you, you're probably going, come on, Neil, let's, let's go eat. Uh, but um, back in the day, I remember they used to have, you, you, we were talking about how powerful a drummer you are. are. And uh, I can remember, I, I have some tapes, in fact, some bootlegs, where I can, uh, somebody's come out during the, the set, well, probably Nicky or Al or one of those guys, um, and they're nailing down your, your kick drum. They're doing something to nail it to the well, yeah, stage I, at the I, bug out and yeah um we used to nail well we had a big piece of plywood that i set my drums on and uh i would nail the front of the bass drum put three nails in the front so the hoops would bump up against that and then usually put a couple nails in the cymbal stand bend them over so the cymbal stands wouldn't fly over and move I, and I, I i guess i play with a lot of um uh, uh, with a lot of needless force and movement. Um, but that was the times, you know, it was like a thing. Um, you had uh, Ginger Baker and Keith Moon, and these guys were maniacs for sure. So I kind of emulated that. And uh, also, too, you have to remember that in those days, we didn't have a, a giant PA system. You know, they had mainly a PA system for vocals, and um, the guitars and amps were, you know, 500 watt amps, and the drums were maybe one microphone or your vocal mic would pick up the drums. So drummers had to really play loud and hard to, um, to uh, you know, get through. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, there wasn't many large PA systems in, in, in Youngstown in those days. I think we were one of the first bands to build a a big PA system and had full miking on the drums eventually and all that. But yeah, I think, you know, you had to, um, remember we were, I was emulating recordings of drummers like Keith Moon, The Who, and uh, Jimi Hendrix and stuff. And um, I had no mic, so that was all studio production. So I had no idea. I, I thought, you know, the guy just hit the drums real hard to get that sound. Mm -hmm. And you know, didn't realize compression and, and that sort of thing. But so yeah, so I, yeah, I played hard and played loud. Hard. Well, one of the things that impressed me is just uh, I was I think fifteen. I was fifteen when I the first time I saw you and Sharon, and you didn't Sharon PA at Beale Park. Oh yeah. You didn't. I think you were just getting the album, the deal. I think, because uh, um, I had talked to. We probably didn't have much of a PA system then. 
it was still so impressive. I remember just being in awe of a trio, a power trio that was doing so many different styles. And it was, it was really, I yeah. never heard anything like you before. But those early, uh, like we, for- We had a lot of harmony vocals. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phil was, you know, phenomenal. And Daniel was really a great singer and a, and a great bass player. So it was, we were able to do a lot of different types of music, you know. Well, your harmonies together are really our synergy. Um, the, um, the the thing that blew me away is like, for example, uh, I think you can go and hear it on YouTube. I'm not sure if it's there or not, but it should be. If not, I'll get it there. Uh, the Bug Out, Boots Bell uh, would introduce you and everything. but. I have uh, a recording of you guys. I think it was in 70. The album was just going to be coming out. I think it was done, I think, because it was winter. And um, I think, I, again, I'm, I'm, we're getting old. I'm getting old. Can't remember everything. But you, in that one jam, one lengthy jam, you covered a Beatles song. You covered a Jimi Hendrix song. You covered Moody Blues. And you covered um, Take Five by the Dave Brubeck. So this was The Bug Out? The Bug Out. Yeah, I heard that recording. In fact, uh, Bootspell's son, Chris, just sent me a link to that. No, he sent me the picture of what you gave him. Okay. And I had a copy of that, too. Yeah, that, that, was, that was fun. We, we, we were doing a lot of different styles of music. It was like... Excuse me. Sure, and, I, and it was really weird because I'm a kid and I'm playing this for... Oh, uh, for my friends, I remember playing something for my friends, and uh, the one guy's father come down and said, "You guys are playing Dave Brubeck." I said, "No, no, we're playing Glass Harp." He says, "No, no, no, that's Dave Brubeck." <laughs> you know, so I think a lot of bands played Take Five. That yeah. was uh, an interesting thing back in those days. And I remember I was in a lounge band um, right when I met Phil before we started Glass Harp, and I was playing with these older guys. But that was our break song, Take Five. Uh, and it was different, because it was in, not in 404, it was in 5-4, time signature, which was different. And plus, it was just iconic. But yeah, we a lot of bands used that as their break song. Um, but it was a fun tune, you know, it had a great bass line. Boom, boom, da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum mm -hmm. da dum da dum you know. Well, I got to say, for me as a, a young, you, of course, you guys were, you're not that much older than me, but um, as a young guitar player and a young person, impressionable. Um, How old are you now? I'm 66. I'm 67. 67. But you guys were light years beyond in age because of experience and stuff, I think. But, I, you know, of course, I never got to be a very good guitar player, but the influence that the glass harp had on me. And I, I know people watching this right now are gonna be able to say, I feel the same way. There is something so special about the, the, the music of glass harp. That, that combination of you three, I don't think it could have happened with any other like combination. I, well, of course we never know because we'll never know about another combination. But this combination had so much, has so much melody, um, passion in the music. Um, there's power in it. There's gracefulness. Um, I don't know whether you guys set out for that or it's just what happened. It's just who you are. But uh, as a glass harp fan, I, I, I hope I'm speaking for a lot of people. I believe I am. We really appreciate the legacy that you guys have have left for us and I'm hoping for more. Well, thanks. Yeah, no, you're a good guitar player. Yeah. You were very good, um, and you had a good teacher. I think Phil had a lot of influence on you, but and you can hear it. So I mean, you you play well. Well, and uh, this is about you. Not many, <laughs> not many people, guitar players, do that. So um, I think that uh, the glass harp definitely, like they say, had a chemistry. The three together. Um, we had a, a chemistry about us, and it's a way of communicating. You know, I think we, it's like a, it's unseen communication, musical communication. It's like it's on the quantum level. Um, 
when one does the other one happens it, it affects the other person too so it's mm -hmm. not we're not we're not separate musically and uh, so I mean even to the point of a thought level you know that Phil has an idea you know or Daniel or me comes into my head before it's even pronounced on our instrument it already is communicated to the other person that's why I say on the quantum level yeah. which is probably crazy but no um, I think musicians get it uh, that happens with musicians and there's so many musicians that uh, have this chemistry and all the different bands that people have liked and musical groups and other things you know not just bands but I mean with any kind of music there's that you know and uh, that chemistry so yeah glass harp had had their brand of it and it, and it made a difference and it's do you still see that today um, when you're doing it, you don't think about that. You're just playing, but you get feedback from people that, that tell you, oh, you know, I really like this. And, you know, so, yeah. Well, I, I, it's it's probably an unfair question to ask, but um, do you think that you guys have another album in you? Uh, I know you, you oh, yeah. never say never, but, you know. We do. I, I, I got another album in the can downstairs on my computer. Of Glass Harp? Or of you? Yeah. Get out! Sure. Oh, you heard it first, folks. <laughs> this is blowing me but away. There could be ten other albums after that. Well, n now I'm going to have to have to drug him and have him make a copy of it for me tonight. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> it's not going anywhere. There's but, lots of recordings that uh, haven't been um, used or utilized, and lots of ideas. Has uh, uh, one of my favorite songs. But yeah, we could do another record at some point. We probably will. One of my favorite unreleased songs is um, Ships Are Sailing. Oh yeah, that was never, well we played played it live a bit in, in the early 2000s. So it was like recorded, it's on some YouTube videos of us right. playing live. That has to be one of my favorite that could be, John yeah, Safara songs. Use that sometime. That's a good song, Phil did a great job on that. Mm -hmm. And we have nice harmonies. But it was never, yeah, it was never, um, yeah, because um, the last record we did was 2003, and I, I hadn't written, composed that song no. until after that, until 2006. Well, it's a beaut, and it's always it's it's always gotten to my heart. If you know, again, I probably sound like a geek here because I am. I've got a bunch of different versions of that song. I mean, mm -hmm. one I did with Phil that um, he played some keyboards in. I did drums. We had a lot of harmonies and stuff, and then we then we played it live. We recorded a couple of lives in the acoustic set of Glass Harp, with no drums, no keyboards, just guitars and bass, and harmonies. But um, so there's different ways to approach that mm -hmm. as far as the recording is. But I think you know instead of a big production of it, I like it. Uh, I would like to see it with you know acoustic guitar electric lead, bass, drums, and harmonies. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful song. It really is. And it's, you know, if, if uh, those of you that are watching this video uh, get a chance, uh, try to find it on, on YouTube because it is beautiful. It's just a, a very heartfelt song. And uh, yeah, I think there's a couple recordings of it. Maybe so. I'm not sure. I well, know one was at the, um, the Dior performing arts center in Youngstown. Right. Well, I'll have to look at the tapes because I, I have those. And So um, anyway, I'm really sorry. We're almost at a half hour on this. What do you, uh, uh, and I appreciate it, and I'm sure everybody watching does. Um, the. Um, I wish I had more to say. Well, I have, a, I could be here with you all day because I have a bunch more questions, but I won't do that to you because you've been so kind with your time. Um, and I, this was un, unplanned. I just thought I'd ask you a couple questions because we've been talking about things online. Um, the Glass Harp fans page, you go there at Facebook. I think you check in once in a while and Al Peffel's yeah, there. And put up something every now and again to find something unique. Well, um, uh, oh, there was some, oh, I was going to ask you. Phil's got the new um, um, Bandcamp page with a lot of recordings. Yeah. And there is a, a rumor that that a lot of people's wishes are going to be met pretty soon with uh, 
possibly a glass harp. Oh yeah, we'll do that. So there'll be a glass harp band camp at it, some point. There's lots of live shows. And, you hear that, folks? And recordings we can put up there. Um, I mean, just I like some of the odd things from years ago, like um, radio station broadcasts that we played acoustically mm -hmm. on. Um, there's several of the, several of those. And then, of course, we were talking about like the bug out, mm -hmm. some old stuff. And then there's a whole lot of new, new things that we concerts we played that have been recorded. You know, the, some are good quality and some are not great quality, but they're interesting. You know, mm -hmm. nevertheless, every show is different. Every Usually, show, yeah, yeah. There's always something, uh, something different. It's always good. So. Well, John, we are at almost 31 minutes. There's Steve. And there's Steve. Where's Steve? There's Steve. Hi, Steve. Steve. You look suspicious. I met Steve many years ago. How, you were just telling me Steve's, Steve, Stevie's pretty, pretty hmm, getting up there. I'm not there. sure. Alexa, we weren't talking to you. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I heard my name. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time on this. This is really great. And uh, thank you for permission to, to be able to share it. And uh, again, some of your friends from uh, from the Facebook page, Al Pethel says hi. Anastasia says hi. And- uh, uh, Hi Al, hi Stacy. So, you know, great friends from, from the day, you know. And, uh, and for what it's worth too, folks, I don't know where you can find it, but a great deal of the wonderful photographs from the early days of Glass Harp were shot by Anastasia Pantsios. Yes, a lot of them. And a lot of them ended up being used as publicity shots. And uh, Al, of course, she, that's what she did professionally. And uh, they were used on the albums, the early albums and all that. And she she uh, headed up the first Glass Harp uh, fan uh fan company or fan page or not page but fan club so see i'm getting old i'm forgetting words <laughs> but she did so but there yeah there was a, a lot of people involved in the whole production and especially the road crew someday we'll have to do a list of road managers and um sound men and roadies that worked with Glass Harp over the years, and uh, it could be interesting. That'd be great. I've, I've been really wanting to talk to Al. I'd like to talk to him on the phone, but you know how I am. I'll never, he'll never get off, because I just don't shut up. Al, but... Al has a lot of stories, and Al was doing a lot of other groups in those days besides Glass Harp. And a wonderful musician in his own right, right? Yeah, Al's a great musician. Um, See, see, talking right now it brings me out to another question. Was Al the one who chased down the guy that stole Phil's uh, 60 Les Paul? I don't know for sure. I, I would imagine. It was one of, one of your crew. Somebody stole Phil's 1960 uh, Gibson Sunburst Les Pauls that are worth a fortune. I vaguely remember that. And one of the roadies chased him down. where we were playing. You know? I don't. I don't. Maybe Al would have that information. or I could see Al, Nicky, or John doing that, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, John, we're now at 34 minutes, so thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Any last words for your, your fans and uh, Glass Heart page? Well, I just have to say um, have a good day. All righty. Thanks, John. Stevie, we'll see ya. What do you think? Say goodbye, Steve. She's going, who is this guy? Get him out of here.